All right, I'd like to call to order uh, the regular meeting of the Independent School District 112 School Board meeting, date September 24, 2018. Uh, board ahead of, in front of us we have an agenda can I get a motion so moved second any questions on the agenda or any modifications all those in favor of adapting the agenda uh, signal by saying aye. aye aye all those opposed same sign great and with that now we're going to move on to um, pledge of allegiance Second order of business is open forum. Jim, any, anybody on the open forum today? Uh, with that, I'd like to invite Jackie Johnson out for an announcement. Really? No? Me? I'm not doing Michelle tonight. Michelle? Not tonight. Michelle? Michelle? All right. Okay. <laughs> Scratch that. <laughs> 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 I did like that blank look. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> See? What? What I, I think that should be a tradition. Um, <laughs> Let's go on someone. Just randomly pick someone out there. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> With that, we'll move to item 2.2, communications from student reps. Lucy? Yeah, so, um, so Chapta beat Chan Hassett in the football game. <laughs> <laughs> we heard that. Yeah, but it was a Item 3.0, consent agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Excellent. Um, with that, any discussion? All right. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda, signal by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion <laughs> carries. Item 4.0, preliminary property tax levy, DD. Okay, thank you. Um, the preliminary levy for the um, Eastern Carver County School District um, began uh, August, back in July, but the most latest run came out this afternoon, so the documents you see in front of you did change, and Caroline uploaded those just a little bit. It's just a slight change. Um, and I also did include this PowerPoint with um, the presentation because there was a number of things I wanted to, to go through with you. Um, so the overall percent increase is 5.88%, uh, and I'll walk you through the preliminary levy and also explain areas where the levy increased and decreased. Um, and then just as a reminder, these are for taxes payable in 2019 and for fiscal year 2019-20. 
So if we first go through just a little bit about the levy process, you can see up on the screen um, items that are that are um, complied and taken care of by district staff. So we take care of entering all the data into the um, levy system. Um, you can see the items listed there. We also take care of the um, submitting the proposed levy as well as the final certificate certificate um, <coughs> to the county um, in December. So the school board, on your behalf, um, you know, if there were any referendum resolutions, you would have had that accomplished before um, this time period. We would be looking at any referendum conversions if that was applicable. But your main role um, starts um, with this meeting of certifying the preliminary levy. Um, as you know, we always have a two taxation hearing. It's held during a regular meeting. That'll be in December. And then at that meeting, we will ask you to also approve the final levy, and we'll have complete figures at that time. The MDE, on the other hand, um, hand they prepare the levy f certification. As I mentioned, the first one came out um, on the 7th. They'll have multiple runs. I expect that even after today, we'll have additional runs. And um, that just takes into consideration things that might change. If it might be some adjustments, maybe enrollments, um, we have better information. School districts might have not um, yet gotten approval on their long-term facility maintenance. So there's a number of reasons why that's left open and the final information coming in. Then from the county and state perspective, the Department of Revenue certifies the adjusted net tax capacity. And then the county, you can see the number of items that they take care of. And reporting that we do goes back to the county, <coughs> which all gets incorporated into the, uh, the tax reports. So for you to look at the, um, the one-page document I sent to you in the preliminary, I'm just going to go through the major components of this. So if we look at the total RMV, or referendum market value levies, these are voter-approved levies. So the, the voters approved these for our Eastern Carver County Schools. And you can see that the net referendum goes up by 5.78%. That's largely due to enrollment changes. So um, not only do we have enrollment increase for this year, then they're, they're truing up prior years, and that's the referendum adjustments that you see in there. Along with that, those equity and transition, those comply with the same thing. They're based on student um, pupil units, and then again, any adjustments that are made. So overall, that levy is at 19.3 million, um, an increase of 960,000 for 5.23%. This next category, a little longer, a lot more uh, kind of a lists of all the different categories that are in here. Some of these are driven, um, voter approved, I'll talk about that. Some of these are driven by board authorization or um, state um, funding formulas. So the major ones that I wanted to review with you is operating capital. That went up $90,000. Again, that one is based on pupil units as well as age um, of our buildings. Um, and then if you go about midway down, you're going to see the capital project referenda. That one is a voter-approved referenda, and it is a certain percent of the increase in our net tax capacity. Our net tax capacity went up over 8% this past year, so thus the increase in that particular levy of $305,000. The next line is the long-term facility maintenance or LTFM and you'll see that that figure originally um, at, certified at 2.1 million so the levy cert, the long-term facility maintenance plan the 10-year plan that you approved this past summer is at 2.145 million I'm proposing giving the long-term facility maintenance uh, or the long-term facility plan that I brought to you last month that we consider increasing this by the 2.2 million, and I'll tell you why in just a little bit when we get down further. But that would bring the total amount to about two or 4.3 million. I know we had discussions of other school districts that have higher LTFM plans to take care of those long, um, those deferred maintenance projects and keeping um, our assets in um, good shape. 
So when you go way down to the bottom, you're going to see the adjustments, and this is where the explanation comes in. Last year, our adjustments was a positive $55,000. This year, you see a negative $2.46 million. So a negative means it's a credit against the tax that we'd, we would be levying. The largest portion of that is $2.2 million in a TIF adjustment. So we have a big TIF, and I believe it's 2016 that came off, and it's a large credit. We knew that that would be um, coming to the district. Now, decreases our overall taxes. It doesn't mean that we lose money because on the flip side, then on the general education aid side, that money is recuperated. So there's no loss in revenue for this TIF that was put in place um, through our within our school district, so within that, looked at you know increasing our LTFM by two point two million. Still, the overall of this particular category is a decrease of 036 percent. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about the impact of that on the taxes. Next, if we look at community services, an 8.21% increase, and it's really due to two factors. The first one is, if you recall, in June, we increased our, our census, our, meaning our population within Eastern Carver County boundaries, and that went from 56,000 to just over 58,000 um, residents. So that's the increase in the basic community ed. And then the school age child care, that's due to increase in um, our access for students going into the school age um, child care program and expenses. So while 8.21 sounds a lot, the total net effect is 71,000. It's a smaller uh, levy of, for the school district. And then finally, the last category is our debt service. Uh, this is for our principal and interest payments, both on our regular GO bonds uh, for building, as well as um, those alternative facility bonds, which we sold uh, probably about seven years ago. A uh, couple things I want to point out on, on here is that our debt service payments stay about the same from 18, uh, just over $18 million, um, 2000 to 8, 18 million 16,000 where you want to note the big change and we've talked about this periodically when we have um, a levy certification if you look at that second line the reduction for debt excess again this is a credit so lowering our taxes so in last year 1.7 million dollar decrease and this year, a decrease of 63000 So it isn't that we're increasing our levy. It's just that we don't have the sizable credit coming in. And so this, there's, a, there's a formula for looking at debt excess, which is a good thing that we do that because, as you know, we levy at 105% of our principal and interest payments. And over time, that adds up along with, as you'll recall, we did a number of bond refundings, which lowered our overall principal and interest payments. So this is just truing up over time what our, what our debt excess, meaning what is extra in our fund balance. Um, and I'll tell you that next year, the next two years, we've calculated out that $63,000 number will be closer to a $1.1 million credit. So the next two years, we'll have that advantage again. Um, the OPEB debt service, that one is an in and out. That's, that's clearing out and will go away next year when we look at the, um, at the levy certification. So while it seems like a lot at 10.10%, it has everything to do with that credit from the previous year. Then if we look at the total amount, so our general fund... Uh, total general fund up 3.26%, community education or community services 8.21, debt service 10.10 for a net of 5.88, and that includes the proposed adjustment of $2,200,000. Um, so when we look at this and what I've explained to um, Mr. Christopher and, and also talked with Pam Jensen, when we look at the property tax impact, we look at what is the, the amount of the tax levy? What is our valuation? And what is that tax rate? So you can see going from uh, fiscal year 15, 16 over to uh, 1920. And if you look at that highlighted referendum market value or RMV tax rate, 
it started out in 2015, school year 15-16, at 0.212%. In 2016-17, went up to 2.272% and has been decreasing since. The increase in 16-17 was due to that operating referenda that was passed in the fall of 15, okay? Then if you go to the net tax capacity and do that same exercise, the levy, our school district levy, you can see those amounts going across um, fairly, you know, in that $28 million up this uh, this last year due to the, uh, the number of things that I described earlier. But you can see the increase in our net tax capacity, which has um, gone up considerably over the last few years. So... While in 2016-17 we did pass a bond referenda, you can see, as we had told taxpayers, our taxes would go down, and they have gone down, okay? So the 36.411, it would be the estimated tax rate based on what I've presented to you so far. So just to look at that in a, in a graph, okay? So you can see where the operating referenda came in play for the RMV, and it's going down. And then in the net tax capacity, the sizable decrease that we see going down as well. So my point in all of this is, is that I think this is our opportunity to still keep taxes going down but be able to provide $2.2 million towards that long-term facility maintenance plan that we talked about, lowering the overall debt that we would have to issue in future years, which would only mean additional interest, et cetera. So with that, a couple more things for you to know is that um, as we've done in the past, we propose that we uh, certify the levy at the maximum. That doesn't mean that we get additional dollars or we can have it at any level. It just means those changes that can come in and make adjustments, those can flow through. On that long-term facility maintenance, we would propose coming back to you in October with a, an updated plan from the plan we presented this summer and incorporate that $2.2 million, what those projects would be. Some of those would be pulled right off of that list from that facility study that we did, okay, and would be incorporated in that, okay? So the last thing I wanted to just show you is looking at different house values. So the darker gray value um, is last year's taxes, and then the orange bar or yellow bar, that would be the proposed taxes based on those property values. So in every case, those are going down. I saw the same thing for um, commercial and industrial apartments, agriculture, all of them would be decreasing. I just picked one particular category to review. So um, that's all I have for you. Um, the request tonight is for the school board to authorize the maximum, and then we can have further discussion at a future meeting to talk about the $2.2 million for the long-term facility maintenance. Great, thanks, DD. I guess before we ask DD questions, um, can we get a motion to certify the preliminary 2018 payable 2019 property tax levy at the maximum? So moved. Second. second. Moved by Anderson, seconded by Meyer. Any questions for DD? Is 2.2 the maximum that you would, or is there, is that the maximum, or is there higher that you? Would we could do higher. We just picked a number that was very close to that TIF adjustment. What is the higher that you would, it's up to? Well, I mean, you could, you could, you could go, you could go $4 million. Oh. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> there, there, you could go more. Just, yeah. yeah. But we would want to well, calculate what the tax impact would be because my guess is that number, I didn't, I didn't run a number like that, but yeah. we wouldn't be seeing a decrease probably. Could still be some, but. And I think that's what's helpful being in a district that we continue to grow with the mm -hmm. tax capacity and other things to be able to still be able to increase the levy to provide more funds, but at the same time have the taxes right. go down for our tax base. So right. Great. Yeah. And that's what the 2.2 .2 was based on, that it would not be higher. Correct. That's what I was looking at. That's yes. That was calculated. As that's right. Number. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah. So would the task force then have input into what that money is spent on, or would that be a different decision, like by the board or the district, or who would decide where it what sure. happens to that money then? You know, I think it would be very hard for a task force to go through that laundry list of things that we had categorized under deferred maintenance and items. For them, they're going. The, a task force would need direction. Mm -hmm. And so I think between um, our, our facilities, our buildings and grounds staff, myself, and um, possibly input from architect, engineer, and um, uh, Cross Anderson or construction, we would work together to make recommendations to that committee. Um, for them to be able to just, okay, Chaska Middle School East needs mm -hmm. a new boiler. Is that more important than Chaska Middle School West's? HVAC system or whatever. So I think we would be providing them the guidance. Um, I know of some things that are not working real well this year that I would recommend we put some money into the LTFM to, to accommodate that. I'd also like to see a little more contingency for when things fail that aren't anticipated in, in that figure. So that would be my recommendation. So there might be some things that have to happen sooner just because yes. it's, an, it's an emergency to have them fixed, but other Correct. things would be the task force would have input on to sure. how it's spent. We'll certainly give them the information that they need, but I think in general prioritizing long-term facility maintenance-related things will we'll need a little more. Here's Here's what we would recommend and here's why. Right, yep, no, yeah. I understand that. Mm -hmm. And I just have one more quick question. Under sure. the community services section, um, could you remind me what the home visiting is again? There's a, a, a I, um, there, a, yeah, it, it's uh, home visits are provided to families, I believe, the childhood. early childhood families. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Obviously, I think um, based on our conversation from our last board meeting, we have a lot of needs here in the district. And one of the benefits to being a growing district is it provides a little bit of flexibility in terms of um, uh, some of those things that we can do. Um, so I think it's great that we have the fl some opportunities here with LTFM with having very little impact and our, our uh, taxes per household is still going down or projected to go down. My question is kind of more of a what if. Uh, there's a lot of what ifs that go into this question, and, mm -hmm. and maybe maybe this isn't um, a, a question that you can answer, Dee Dee, at this point. But looking at the 2.2, is this a is this an amount, an additional amount that you would like to see based on our laundry list of needs that we have each year moving forward? And if so, um, how does that impact us as we look at our five uh, five year forecast in terms of mm -hmm. our operating? Um, uh, referendum and maybe having to go back out and ask for additional funds in terms of can we do both? Sure, that's a great question. So, um, as you know, you um, typically try to keep your levy fairly consistent and not fluctuate like this. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a couple of um, more years of debt excess that will be coming up that will assist us with. Um, any operating referenda or bond referenda that we have coming along. Um, this is one levy, the LTFM, that if we need to, we could lower, right? We could we could under levy in that. Um, you know, my hope is is that we get it, you know, if we can get it around that 4.2 to 4.8, whatever number that is, and keep that fairly consistent, I think it would serve the community very well, but we would we would definitely run take a look at how does that impact our operating referenda and a future bond referenda as well. Yeah. Uh, to me, this is I mean really exciting. So um, let me rephrase and make sure I understand this because sometimes it doesn't make sense to me. So we're lowering taxes, but we're we're still going to have an increase in funds. Correct. Correct. Yay. Yeah. I mean, wow. The tax, I mean, the tax rate goes news? down. The tax rate goes down. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's what's, uh, you know, like you said, the advantage of a growing district. Um, you know, I've had, I had conversations about the new buildings, and somebody said, and yet my taxes haven't increased. The last two years they've gone down. Correct. And I checked my own taxes as well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, that's really good news that we need to continue to share. Mm -hmm. um, and will be good news as 
we also found out that obviously that that piece isn't going to hit all of the needs that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just shows how um, how careful we are um, with the tax dollars that we right. have, and we do need to be careful with them because they're they're not ours. But right. and, and these buildings are theirs to take for us to take care of too. So. Right. I mean, I think this is really good news, and I appreciate the work you put into this and the sure. recommendation. Sure. I think we'd be short-sighted if we only looked at what the percent increase was in the tax levy. You have to couple that with what is the tax rate and what is the impact to the taxpayer. Yeah. And thank you for providing this information. Sure. You're welcome. Um, because it's nice to see it. I know we, we, we look a lot at that $300,000 home. Yeah. Um, but we have a lot of, of sure. homeowners oh, right. around Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yep. yep. Yeah, I think from that standpoint, too, Didi, I know later on we're going to be talking more about the long-term facility. Now, we talked a lot about that in our board work mm-hmm. session. Right. So that, you know, the board is up to speed on kind of what those needs are. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's great to be able to see, knowing that that level of priority is out there, an ability to kind of provide some additional funds to, to mm-hmm. just be able to shore up some of that stuff. Any additional questions? All right. Good news. Let's call, let's, I'll call this to motion. Uh, all those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Great motion carries. Thanks, TD. Thank you. Next order of business, 4.2, contract ratification principles. Yes, good evening. <coughs> uh, the principles contract is the second contract that I've, I'll be bringing uh, b- before you in this uh, round of negotiations here. I brought the nutrition services uh, last month and principals this month. I do hope to kind of pick up the pace, otherwise I'll be doing this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so right. um, but anyway, with the principals association is composed of the principals and assistant principals and administrative deans. Their total compensation package is 5.65%. For the two-year period, that compensation package includes an increase in wages each year and also an increase to the district contribution to insurance in year two. Uh, It also includes a couple letters of agreement where we're going to take a look at a couple things. Uh, We're going to review the performance pay structure and the administrative structure in the buildings. There were really uh, minimal, minimal language changes because, as you know, we had all the contracts reviewed um, last time around with, uh, with the negotiations. Uh, so we took care of um, uh, a lot of those language changes for the two, 2016 and 18 contract. So with that, the administration recommends board <coughs> approval of the proposed contract agreement with the Principals Association. Thanks, Jim. With that, can I get a motion to approve um, the overall agreement as defined? So moved. Second. Moved by Anderson, seconded by Logue. Any discussion? Jim, can you tell us a little bit more about those two memor- um, memorandums of understanding? Yeah, um, the performance pay structure right now is based on uh, like a building goal and also a McCrell evaluation. And so we're just going to kind of talk about that. If you remember, we, we had a little bit of a change in the teacher's contract also mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the QCOMP. And so we're just going to do the same thing with the principals. And then uh, the other thing we're going to take a look at is the administrative structure in the building. So you're talking about, you know, principals, assistant principals, administrative deans. We do have some, you know, differences in our buildings, whether, uh, whether we're going to take a look at size or... Um, you know, um, student populations and that sort of thing. So uh, we haven't done that for a long time, and so we're just going to take a look at that. All right. Yeah. Very good. Did you bring your principals with you tonight? Yeah, they all came. Well, I was a little nervous when I saw all of them. <laughs> so we. But they're here for something else, you know. Are, so they, are, I, they, are they afraid we won't pass this? Well, I, I, I was going to tell you to make sure that you do pass it, because <laughs> otherwise I'm going out that door. Okay? So, no way back that way, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Any additional questions for Jim? I'd like to call this uh, motion to order then, or the motion. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Great, motion carries. Right. Thanks, Thank, Jim. Thank you very much. 
All right, we are done with board actions. We get to move on to reports. World's best workforce, Amy. Is this what all the principals are here for? This is what all the principals <laughs> are here for. We invited them to join us for this. Well, good evening. As you know, tonight is our annual report for the world's best workforce. Um, I have with me the teaching and learning team, as well as you can see, several principal reps from uh, all of the various levels have also joined us. As required by the 2013 Minnesota State Statute, school districts and school boards are required to hold an annual public meeting to review progress toward realizing the previous year's goals um, outlined in the 2017-18 World's Best Workforce Plan, as well as to share our district goals and strategies for the 2018-19 school year. On November 12th, we'll be back before you. Um, we'll offer an opportunity for any public um, comment related to our goals or strategies, as well as ask for your approval of our plan. Um, and then following that, all school districts are required to either publish or post their annual report uh, to their website, as well as to submit a summary of their progress toward the world's best workforce to the Commissioner of Education at the Minnesota Department of Education by December 1st. So as we look at our district's progress and results, as you know, we reviewed our um, North Star, the, the North Star accountability system, and our district's ratings, as well as our MCA results at the last school board meeting. Tonight, we'll address the five areas of the world's best workforce on October 24th, we'll be back before you with our district dashboard indicators. And then finally on November 12th, we'll invite the principals to join us again to share our focus five or our building goals and strategies in helping us realize um, the goals that we'll be sharing with you tonight. So the world's best workforce covers five key areas um, that were outlined initially as a part of the Minnesota waiver but now I've just become part of our district's or our state's work um, in improving learning uh, statewide. The first area is all students uh, ready for kindergarten or meeting school readiness goals. The second is all third graders reading at grade level or achieving grade level literacy by the end of third grade. The third goal is closing achievement gaps among all of our student groups. The fourth goal is having all students attain college and career readiness uh, prior to graduation. And then finally, the last goal is all students graduating from high school. Tonight, we'll walk through and first address our progress toward each of our goals in these five areas, followed by sharing with you our goals that we've outlined for the 18-19 school year. And then we'll address some of our key strategies uh, to help us in achieving those goals. So the first goal Amy uh, referenced was having all, school, all students ready uh, to start school. And the way we've been measuring this um, for quite a while is using the uh, Minneapolis um, uh, assessment tool that is really a developmental screening tool. And our goal is to screen all three-year-olds um, in preparation for coming to school. Um, our goal was really to get um, to 26%, so to decrease that by 2%, which we fell short of, and so we stayed consistent at 24%. Um, but we, it's also caused, given us reason to say, are we really asking the right question? Are we using the right uh, instrument to measure some things? Uh, the developmental screening that we use, it's not really to assess um, intelligence or anything like that. It really is a developmental screener to say, is the child um, making good cogn cognitive progress? Are they finding gross motor skills on track, speech and language? So it really is kind of a pass-fail kind of thing. And the goal is to get kids early so that an intervention can be had in, in, in advance of that. Um, as we've implemented the assessment days this year, it's gotten us thinking about can we start using some different instruments and some of the data that we're collecting those first couple of days of school on each individual child 
um, and start then using that information to share with parents saying, these are the benchmarks that we're going to be looking for for students that we would say would be school ready. So it's, it's given us reason to, to talk about that. Oops, excuse me. The second goal was really, is really around all students um, being on track for grade level literacy, and we measure this at the third grade level. So our goal in 17-18 was to move from 67.9% to 69.9%, a 2% increase. Again, it's not where we wanted it to be. We landed at 66.3%. Um, we've started to put additional measures in place. Um, this past year, we've, uh, we just purchased toward the end of the year new assessment kits for all schools. They're called benchmark assessment kits. Uh, some of the instruments we had been using at the schools gave teachers the opportunity to assess a student, but then they had to can do a conversion to get an actual score. Um, some of the data that Clint shares with you uh, during those dashboard indicators, he'll reference some of that information. So we're tightening up some of that. Again, the early intervention, that uh, additional screening or rather assessment that we're doing those first two days of school are going to give us more information up front so that we can hit the ground running and start the year with implementing um, better strategies. I'm going to talk about closing the achievement gap in both areas of reading and math. And just to give you a little information before I get into it, I'll really look at three pieces right here. These are our goals from last year, but then I'll also show two different charts, and I'll explain those as I'm working through. Um, additionally, you'll see that some of the numbers and results are in green, some are in blue, and some are in red. Green indicates that's an area that we met a goal from last year. Blue is an area that means we did not meet the girl goal but showed growth, and then red means we didn't meet the goal and we did not show growth in that area. So you can see here there are six different groups that uh, we had goals around, and as you can, as you can see with our reading, uh, closing the achievement gap data, there were, two, there were four areas that we sh showed growth uh, with our Hispanic students, um, bland, black or, I'm sorry, EL students, uh, and then our special education students in free and reduced. Two of those groups, um, we did meet goal. There was one group that uh, we did not meet goal and, and declined uh, just by a tenth of a percent there. But I wanted to give you some context of our goals from last year. Uh, this is a chart that goes through, uh, and really the purpose of this chart gives you a little bit of an idea just in a, a one snapshot of the the gap that does uh, continue to persist uh, throughout the years from 2014 to 2018. Again, you can see in 2018, uh, from 2017 eight to 18, uh, same pieces of data that uh, show growth in those areas that I just indicated. Um, but really the purpose of this this chart here is just to show you um, that gap between our, our white non-Hispanic origin students and the other five groups um, that are on the chart. Next is a, another way to look at the data, and it's really looking at each different group um, indicated in, in the data. And it gives us an opportunity to look at the trend data for each one of those groups. So you can also see from this data and bar graph how the gap, the, the bars for the white non-Hispanic, of course, and the, the data is a little bit higher there, but it gives you an opportunity to take a look at the trends uh, for each one of those groups. So it's a good opportunity for us as we take a look at data as to how are these different groups trending. Are they inconsistent, trending upward, um, declining, and then starting to ask ourselves questions as to why and how do we continue to, to seek opportunities for growth to support all learners. Now, transitioning to math, so three same charts with the same uh, type of information. As you can see from a math perspective, the different groups, not as much growth as we'd like to see. Uh, our free and reduced did meet the, their intended goal. Uh, also, EL students did grow, um, but didn't quite meet uh, the intended goal. And our Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, and special ed groups uh, did not meet the goal from last year and then also showed a decline um, from a math perspective. Again, same charts. This chart here 
shows the, the gap, as I indicated with the reading data. Um, very similar chart here. Uh, again, going back to our areas of growth, uh, our white non-Hispanic origin students grew 1.4%. Our EL students uh, grew six-tenths of a percent. And our uh, free and reduced students in the area of math grew, what is that, two and two-tenths of a percent. And same chart shows the trend. So again, we can take a look at these groups and take a look at the trends, uh, five-year trends as to how they're performing. I would say from a, from a math perspective, the, the trend is a little bit inconsistent. So we see some more ups and downs throughout those five years. Again, causes us to ask some questions, identify how can we continue to support all students um, in areas in the area of math. So I will let David talk more about college and career readiness. Good evening, board. Our next goal is around all students college and career ready, and the measure we choose to use for that is the ACT test, specifically looking at the scores when our juniors take the test. Last year, 752 of our students took the ACT in the spring, and the reason we use the ACT test is uh, it is as close as we can come, in our opinion, to an end of high school assessment. Um, ACT has also done some research around the concept of college and career readiness, and what they do is uh, identify a benchmark in each one of the subscores. And their concept of a benchmark suggests that at a particular score in that subscore, a student stands a 50% chance of getting a B or higher in a related college course, or approximately a 75% chance of getting a C or higher in a related course. And our goal is for students to be college and career ready, so what we really focus on is students who meet the benchmark in all four areas, but what you see in the graph are the four subdomains, college English composition, college algebra, college social science, college biology. And you'll see that with the green bars in this case, um, it was not necessarily a 2% increase, but an increase over the previous year. You'll see the blue bar indicates that we held steady, and the red bars were below the previous year, or in the case of all students who met all four benchmarks, uh, our result was below our goal for the previous year. The previous data was around our juniors, and we had our data for that. Unfortunately, ACT has pushed back the release of their graduating class data, so we do not yet have the graduating class data for the class of 2018. This is the, cl the class data for the class of 2017. What you see here is for the graduating students, and the difference in the data is in part due to the fact that when ACT provides this report, they use the most recent ACT score. So when we look at our junior ACT data, students may have taken the test again after that, and it ultimately changes what they report out to the, us then for our graduating students. But we're looking here at college and career readiness over the past, uh, or, or 17 compared to the state of Minnesota. We think that's an interesting comparison. And then on the right-hand side, what you see is a five-year history of our graduating class average ACT scores in each one of the subdomains and then for the composite score overall. Out of curiosity, I did look back a little bit further on our data and in 2008 found that about 72% of our students had taken the test. So we've really worked towards increasing in the state of Minnesota for a while required, and our school district still asks all of our students to take the test and provides payment for that, so it's free to them. But in 2008, 72% of our students took the test, and we had a composite score of 22.4. So when we're testing 97.7% of our students and we've increased our composite score over time, we feel good about those results, making the opportunity available to students and still increasing our composite score as an average for all of our students moving forward. The next goal is around all students graduating from high school. You can see that the Minnesota goal is 90% of all students on a four-year average. Um, and we have a result of 91.7% <coughs> of our students graduating, which we think is pretty good. Um, the state now also calculates a five, six, and seven-year average 
So I did a little bit of digging into our uh, 17 data, the most recent data that we've got. And what I learned was uh, <coughs> if you look at our graduation rate at 91.7%, that means students who at the end of their senior year or fourth year uh, were recognized as graduating. And then the state of Minnesota also calculates students who are considered continuing. And of our students, 6.3% of our students are recognized as continuing. So they're continuing their educational program even though they may not have graduated in that 91.7%. That only leaves 0.9% of our students who are considered dropouts and 1.1% of our students who are considered unknown in that graduating class. And all of those, uh, those issues are below the state average. Our graduation rate is higher than the state average. So next we'll move into the goals that we've set for the 2018-19 school year. Um, we'll review goals for the three core areas, reading, math, and science, as well as goals for the five areas outlined in the world's best workforce. If we met our goal this previous year or improved, we increased our goal for this next year by 2%. However, if it was an area that we saw a decline in, we maintained our goal from last year. We decided that we wanted to be a little more aggressive in those areas and um, continue to uh, work toward uh, showing those improvements um, that we are looking to see. So first, as we look at reading, um, you'll remember that our goal for this previous year was a 2% goal from 2017. The goal was 70.7%. We achieved 69%. So our goal for spring of 2019 will be 71%. In the area of math, you'll see that in 2017, we achieved 62.7%. Our goal was 64.7%. In 2018, our results showed that 63.4% of our students were at or above proficiency. So our goal for 2019 will be 65.4% of all students meeting or exceeding on the Minnesota accountability tests. And then in the area of science, our goal for this past year was 65.7%. We saw a decrease in this area, as you'll remember from our discussion at the last board meeting, achieving 57.5%. However, we're going to maintain our goal for this current year at 65.7%. And then we move into the goals for world's best workforce that we outlined earlier. Um, so we're going to stay with the 2% increase for that uh, readiness goal for, for students being screened or young learners being screened. Um, again, we're questioning whether or not that's the best uh, tool to use, but we're going to stick with it for this year. And then now once we have some data from our assessment days, determine what's next if we change the, the instrument we're going to use. Uh, for third grade uh, literacy levels, we're because we fell short of our goal, in fact, uh, quite short at 63 points or 66.3%. Our goal is being set at 69.7% uh, to really make that growth and continue that progress. Our closing the achievement gap goals. I'll go through reading and math using the same strategy as Amy uh, documented. So first, our Hispanic group, our goal would be to increase from 39% uh, to 41%. Uh, the group did meet their goal last year. Uh, for our black non-Hispanic, they did not meet their goal last year and showed a decline. Our goal would to increase from 45.8% to 79, or I'm sorry, 47.9%. For our EEL group, they did meet their goal last year, so our goal this year will be increasing from 14.4% to 16.4%. Our special education group did not meet 
their goal last year. However, they did uh, show growth. So their, this group's goal would be from 41%, an increase from 41.4% to 43.4%. In our free and reduced group, they did not meet their gro- goal but showed growth. Uh, so we're looking for an increase from 43.3% to 45.3%. And I, I failed to, to note that it would be the same measure as last year, all accountability tests, which would be our MCA and MTOS. Same strategy with the math, same measures, MCA and MTOS. Our first, first group indicated our Hispanic group. They did not meet their goal last year and showed a decline. So looking for a goal, an increase from 20, 27.9% to 32.7%. Our black non-Hispanic origin group uh, did not meet their goal and showed a decline. Uh, we're looking to increase from 32.3% to 37.5%. Our EL group, student group, did uh, not meet their goal, goal, but they showed growth. So we're looking for an f- increase from 15.3% to 17.3%. Our special education group uh, did not meet their goal and showed a decline. So we're looking to increase from 31.8% to 38.3%. And our free and reduced group didn't meet their goal last year. We're looking for an increase from 31, or 34.1% to 36.1%. And David will talk a little bit about the next goals. Our goal around all students, college and career ready, we are going to continue to use the ACT readiness in all four uh, benchmark areas. And you'll see that we've set the goal at 38%. Uh, We went down 1% last year, so we're going to strive for the goal from the previous year. We have been as high as 40% in the past five years and believe we can achieve that. Our goal for all students graduating from high school, you'll see a goal of 93.7%. We think that's a pretty aggressive goal. One of the things we're starting to talk about is when you get above those 90%, is it reasonable to maintain a 2% increase? Um, But we want to set a high goal, especially around all students graduating from high school, believing that is critical for their future. So we set that goal at 93.7%. And then you'll see the goals for each one of the uh, smaller student groups as we break them out, 2% in some areas, and then at a minimum of 67% for any group that hadn't previously (coughs) been that high. And those are our goals for college and career readiness, as well as all students graduating from high school. So the next area is to review our key strategies to uh, support us in achieving the goals that we just outlined. Tonight we'll do a summary, so it'll be somewhat at a high level um, as far as those strategies go. And like I mentioned on November 12th, we'll be coming back with all of our building goals, and you'll see how this work really translates to each of our schools and each of our various levels. Also, as we uh, put together our key strategies, we did receive feedback from the Teaching and Learning Advisory um, in early September, as well as the DLT, um, and just checking, you know, the work that we're doing and uh, making sure that we're being comprehensive as we think about this work. So our first strategy really is around alignment. Um, It's alignment of our achievement goals and actions. And that's really looking at our district goals and strategies, looking at our building-based focus five, looking at our professional learning communities, and really making sure that we're all um, pushing in the same direction, that we're focused on the same areas. Um, Our work around setting building goals was also informed by uh, review of our building personalized learning self-assessment that we did at that August 1st retreat. Uh, The principals looked at more at the second day of our district leadership team um, retreat in early August, and will be a part of our Focus 5 meetings that we'll be having at each of the buildings um, this week and next week as we review their goals, their action plans, and the support that they need um, from teaching and learning. So really making sure that the arrows we have are all pointing in the same direction from district to building to teacher teams um, district-wide. 
um, along that same line, the professional learning that we're, that's being offered for teachers is really tightly focused around those achievement goals. So as Amy said, uh, administrators and uh, coaches spent time this summer looking at assessment data from a district level and a building level and then have continued to dig in deeper so that they could look at grade levels, et cetera, at their own building. Um, and then really diagnosing what are the needs and then the what's next for, for learning and instruction. Um, we've also spent time, I think when we talked about all the summer work that was going on, we had teachers in in June to really look at what were some of those uh, learning targets, power standards, what, what did it mean to meet that standard, what sort of assessment would be used to really uh, sh to have the learner show that they knew and could meet that learning target and assessment, so aligning more of that work as well. Uh, the next bullet around coaching and support aligned to achievement goals. Um, we have instructional coaches, personalized learning coaches, digital learning coaches, and a literacy coach at the elementary level. We included all of them in the administrative work on August 1st to really start taking a look at what are we all working toward? What are those high level and high yield goals that we have uh, around achievement? And how do we make sure that our efforts are all pointing teachers in the same direction? Uh, to help learners uh, meet those thresholds of learning. And then finally, we're uh, not finally, but the next bullet is around administrative classroom visits and reflection time. Um, both administrators and coaches are in classrooms doing visits with teachers and seeing what's going on in the classrooms. At the elementary level, because the majority of teachers are all teaching math and all teaching uh, uh, language arts, we can focus some uh, some of those instructional visits around mathematics instruction and around literacy instruction. At the secondary level, it may be more content specific, but also it's looking for things like standards alignment. How are we teaching to standards? How are we ensuring that students uh, know or learners know what's expected of them and whether or not they're meeting that? So using those strategies, not just to evaluate teachers, but to actually provide actionable feedback to them so that we're in this together to make everything better. The next key strategy is really focusing on year two of our standards-based learning work. And uh, the principals that are here uh, have done an excellent job of leading that work in the building and teaching and learning, building a strong partnership with them. There's really two, two components of the work. Last year, we spent a lot of time with K-8 as well as some of our high school folks to refresh and develop our power standards and learning targets. And we talked a little bit about, I'll give you an update on that uh, in July. Uh, we had over 100 courses, K through 12, go through the refresh process. And what that did is it gave us an opportunity to look at uh, specific data around benchmarks where we're um, showing gains and, and strength as well as opportunities for growth. So using data as well as our M MCA test specs, taking a look at what are the priorities at the state uh, are identifying within a particular grade level or course uh, for those standards and also uh, achievement descriptors. So what would a third grade math, what would be some concepts that would look like as a, as a student were to meet uh, proficiency or to exceed or to partially meet? So really trying to pull as much information as we can to make the absolute best informed decisions as we're writing our power standards and learning targets and ensuring that they are written at the right level of rigor. So as we are, are teaching and assessing students, that we're providing them with feedback that's on target. It's very important to the process. Spent a lot of time last year um, working through that. And the conversation really evolved throughout the course of the year as teachers became more comfortable with the work and had a, a, just a much higher level of engagement and had very deep, rich conversations about that work. So we're excited to implement that this year and believe that our, our current power standards and learning targets are in a, a, a better place, an improved place than they were last year. The second piece of this work is really around the implementation of standards base. So talked a little bit about the, the phase of progression of writing power standards and learning targets and refreshing, and then the, the planning of teaching and assessing, and then finally the third phase of the implementation. So really working closely with our, our building leaders, our building leadership teams, our coaches, uh, to support teachers as they work through the process. So it's not just about creating implementation phase structure and say, 
ready, set, go without support. So that's what we're working through throughout the course of the years. Really, what are those supports that we need to provide teachers in fa- in all phases, but really around the instruction, assessment, feedback, and reporting? Because that's really where we're going to start supporting students and providing those high levels of descriptive feedback around rigorous learning targets. Uh, and that's the work that we're going to continue to do throughout the course of the year. The second piece uh, that I'm going to talk about is K-12 Vertical Team Program Review. So we're looking at starting with reading and math uh, around some of the the data that we showed you. But what that would look like is bringing a a representative from each grade level in those particular content areas as well as support staff to the table looking at key pieces of data, uh, having dialogue around that data, asking questions and wonderings and really taking a look and taking a step back and looking again at the standards, looking at our practices from an instruction perspective, assessment perspective, feedback, and looking at the resources and ultimately coming out and identifying where are our strengths in those particular areas and where where are our opportunities for growth and then how can we work collectively together to address those opportunities for growth. So that's work that uh, the teaching and learning department will lead this year in partnership with our building leadership, um, as well as classroom and and support staff teachers. Uh, It will really give us an opportunity to take an in-depth look at these uh, content areas and really trying to uh, diagnose evidence-based diagnosis to create some focus areas around our continuous improvement in those areas. The final key strategy for the upcoming school year is multi is around our multi-tiered system and supports work. Really exciting work that we started last year with the uh, the research educational research <coughs> arm of the University of Minnesota. Cary came out and spent time with us after the first of the year. Met with our MTSS leadership team multiple times. Helped us gain a deeper and better understanding of what multi-tiered system of supports is. Um, sometimes previously referred to as RTI. Um, and do an assessment in our buildings with our leadership teams about understanding the key elements, helping us identify where we currently are with the implementation towards those key elements, and then at the end of the process, helping us establish goals for the upcoming school year. So part of what we learned was with our work around standards-based learning and teaching and learning for power power standards and learning targets, one of our strengths providing clarity about the learning outcomes that we want for students as we move forward. Where would we like them to get to? What do we want them to know? Areas for us to continue to work on in the upcoming school year is around assessment, the formative and summative assessments that go along with our classes, as well as our balanced assessment plan so that we have a good way to screen students, uh, help diagnose if they're maybe struggling with learning, and then get them into interventions and continue to monitor their progress moving forward. So we'll continue to work on assessments. Uh, continue to work on our instructional strategies. The tier in multi-tiered system and supports really refers to the framework's model of three tiers. High quality core instruction for all students. That's the high quality effective strategies that we use in our classrooms with all of our students. But as we begin to assess and personalize, how do we provide supports and interventions for students who might not Um, be at the level we want them to be at with a particular power standard or learning target. They might need additional support in a group setting and or with additional individual supports that they might be working in. So the tiers are all student work, sometimes small group work, and if needed, even individual work. And that's how we identify the needs that students have through our assessments. We talk about high quality core instruction and then the interventions that we provide for them and we continue to monitor their progress. So we're really excited about that opportunity um, to work on our assessments, to work on our interventions. And then the third part of that really is bringing in our data so that we can make informed decisions as we continue to work forward, not only at a district and a teaching and learning or building level, the high level data that you see, but all the way down to the classroom level to inform instruction between students and teachers. Uh, Bringing on our data warehouse, currently getting that set up so that we can make and collect our data, make it more easily accessible to our teachers and our buildings and our leaders so that they can make informed decisions. So it'll really continue our work around assessment, continue our work around high quality core instruction, and improve our our culture around data so that we can inform our decision making as we move forward. So that's our final key strategy for the 18-19 school year. 
Unless Amy has any other summary information, I think our last slide is to take questions from the school board. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks, thanks, Amy, Brian, Chris, David, for a lot of information. Um, open it up to school board for questions. Okay. A um, couple comments that I had. I just um, I appreciate the, the the increase in goals um, higher. I think last year we just did two percent, no matter what. Um, and so I did uh, see that we are increasing our goals higher than 2%, especially at the levels that we did not meet. So thank you for um, listening and doing that this year. Um, you know, obviously we were just concerned about the results and there's quite the gaps between the schools. Um, but nonetheless, we do have the principals here and I do wanna thank you guys for all you do for our district and we appreciate your efforts, your long hours. We know you guys are just as disappointed too in some of these results and we know you're working hard to reach these goals in the upcoming year and we just want to say that we thank you and we appreciate your hard work. Thank you. So there's obviously a really big gap between when kids take the MCAs and then when we get to find out how they did. And it seems to me that a lot of the changes, like curriculum writing, all that stuff happens in the summer when, like between that time, like I took the test and we don't know the results yet. And I'm not suggesting we do like a full-blown survey or something. Do teachers ever just informally ask their kids, what did you think was hard? What did you think was easy? And I mean, obviously you're going to get a variety of answers, but I mean, if 85% of the kids say, I didn't understand this math thing, I mean, that might be an indicator that somewhere something isn't being taught to at this school correctly or across the board correctly. And I wonder if we just couldn't use that instant feedback to try to get some idea just on broader concepts of this was really easy or this was really hard instead of doing all this work and then finding out at the end that was, you know, we didn't adjust correctly anyway. Yeah, part of our process as we go through the refresh of the Parsons and Learning Targets Teachers do make comments on those, so the sheets are open to teachers making comments. So exactly what you're referring to, when they see there's an area of concern both ways, something that might not be as rigorous as it should be or something that is just not uh, at the level that they, they thought, then teachers go into that sheet and write a comment. So then as the committee works, they review all of those comments and then make adjustments appropriately. So that's kind of how we built in getting that just direct feedback from teachers um, because we can't have every, especially from an elementary perspective, not every teacher's at the table as we're, we're writing that. So that is the avenue to really, to really um, get that feedback. And we really stress to teachers if there is something that either students have feedback on or something that they see is not working to really make sure that they they write that comment so the committee can can react to that okay and then i just had one more comment too i mean it is it is just so important to get that um early childhood screening number up because both of my kids qualified for speech services one was kind of borderline but one there was no doubt and from like age two on and she did two years of speech um, before she even got to kindergarten, and I don't know how I don't know how she would have fared in school if she wouldn't have had this. So it is just so vital that we get the word out that it isn't. It's not an IQ test. It's just to make sure that your kids are meeting the milestones because there are kids. I know there are kids that are held back because they can't talk. I mean, my own daughter would have been one of them if she wouldn't have been identified before she turned three. She would have gone to kindergarten not being able to communicate with people. And I just, it's just so important that we get that word out any possible way to families. And I know a lot of efforts have been made not only to get the word out about preschool screening, but our early childhood staff has worked with our kindergarten to identify what are the readiness skills that we're expecting or that kids should attain by age three, age four, and age five. And I know we've had lots of conversations about how can we use our marketing arm to help get that in more of our community's hands earlier. Of course, by the time kids enter kindergarten, we have a much higher percent of students who have been screened, but really trying to get that emphasis on screening by age three. We agree with you in the importance of that. Um, I wanna first echo what Josie said and just thank you principals for the work that you guys do every day, including the teachers as well. Obviously, we sit up here and we hear a lot about data um, the reality is tied up in that data is uh, the individual stories of the kids that you serve and the families that you serve every day that we can't necessarily see in the data. And so we just, um, we just appreciate the, the hard work that you guys do, and we know that you're 
certainly concerned with goals um, as we are and some of the data as well, which is why you're here tonight. So thank you for being here. Um, a couple of the things that, um, a couple of the questions that I had, um, first of all, um, I don't remember who it was that mentioned that the Teaching and Learning Advisory Committee had given feedback. I'd be interested to hear some of the feedback that they had in particular to the world's best workforce data. As we talked with them and shared the data, we did ask them to note their wonderings. And again, it's teachers, it's um, community members. Um, I think with the gap, it's probably not unlike any of the conversation we have. That's probably one of the more, um, I guess one of the points of data that stands out more because we start looking at each of the student groups. Um, they have some insights into what's happening at their level as it relates to reading and math. Um, some thoughts about science um, as well, uh, but their their thoughts were very specific to their area of like, well, we're working on inquiry-based math or we're just Im implementing that this year. Um, is science being taught at all grade levels, you know, every year? So a lot of questions that then we can use to inform the work that we'll do. Our goal now will be, as we move forward and work with those vertical alignment teams, to really try to tease out that feedback as well as the principles. Um, there wasn't great themes. I think more of the themes we shared around the MCA data last week or two weeks ago at the board meeting. I don't know, David, did anything else, or Chris or Brian, anything else stand out from those groups? Oh, yeah, you had to go look for the lost measure. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I also was wondering, do you have any, the, in particular, the grad rate, special ed, special ed um, grad rate went down 15%. Is there any, any more feedback in terms of, have we been able to analyze that at all in terms of anything anecdotally that might have played into that? No, I, actually no, and we kind of had the same question, and um, we know Laura's not here tonight, so we haven't had a chance to dig into that um, deeper at this point, um, including how many of those students might be our continuing students, right? right? So we have, we have strong programs in Eastern Carver County Schools that actually draw special education students and serve our own students. Our students moving on to our STAR program, you know, we've... Um, I've come to you asking to hold that at a certain level so we don't increase the number of students there. So I believe we have strong programs. We have uh, a large number of students. We've been increasing the number of special education students in our district over the past few years, along with our overall population. But we haven't dug, dug further into that yet to see if Laura or her staff have any other indications about, did we anticipate that because of the needs of the students that we're moving on into our continuing programs, or is there something else that we just aren't aware of yet? And that's that's kind of why I brought the question up is that can be a little bit deceiving in terms of if they are, if we're continue to serve them because right. that's what's in the best interest and of the students. And that's what's in their IEP goal, the teams are making right. those decisions. Right. That's, an, that's a great thing to do actually right. for their benefit. So we can dig into that a little bit more and make sure that it's a continuation issue that really is not a negative then perspective on the graduation rate overall. Great, great. thank you. Thanks, Ron. Um, and then one last point. Um, not really a question as much as it is a comment. Um, in terms of the goal setting, I guess um, I differ with jo Josie a little bit. I think I would prefer to actually um, not necessarily go 2% all the way across, but I also ask the question on, is this goal that we're creating and making actually attainable? Mm -hmm. And so as we look at the goal on science moving from 57.5 to 65.7, I would ask the question rhetorically, um, what in our history or what, uh, what data would suggest that that's actually an attainable goal? Not just a wish, which sure, we'd love to get there, but is it actually something through our strategies that we're implementing, something that we realistically believe that we can meet? And that's one example, but I would, I would challenge that across the board in terms of creating those goals. Is 2% or going above 2% because we didn't meet the goal last year, is that just we're saying because we didn't meet it, now we're now it's going to be even more lofty? Or is there a better goal that we can create that maybe next year you come back and we can see a bunch of those greens across the board? So that's the feedback that I give on the goals. Yeah, I would echo. I, 
Speaker Ron. Thank you, Ron. I would echo that. Um, especially I, the, the graduation rate, um, you know, we really bumped that goal and we're already at 90%. So, yeah, I just don't want to set us up and, and um, I hate to say this, but, you know, set us up for failure. I do think that we really need to look at those goals and set attainable goals. And um, these people work really hard. And um, I, I don't know. I just, I would hate, I, I know the MCA results weren't what we had hoped, but that shouldn't take away from the fact that they do really good work. And our kids are really working hard and making good progress. And so we have to kind of keep that in mind as well. So, yeah, I, um, I would agree with you, Ron, on, on, you know, let's make sure we have attainable goals to reflect um, the achievement that is happening. Um, while I have the floor, um, can we dig into a little bit of these strategies? Sure. Um, which strategies, and I'm sure you said it, but there was a lot said, so just, you know, be remedial with me a little bit. Which strategies are, are new this year? Well, um, for sure the, the coaching support, mm -hmm. that it's, it's much more focused on. Uh, academic instruction and student achievement than it has been in the past. Um, when we first began our instructional coaching program, um, teachers had never really had another colleague in their classroom before. So there was a threshold of just getting over having somebody else there. Even though they were there to coach and observe and provide feedback, it was someone else is watching me now. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we really feel like we're past that point. We're at the end of the beginning. So now we can move into something um, that is, is much more tailored and focused on instruction. In fact, this year as we hired and placed instructional coaches, um, we looked for people who had some expertise or experience in the level in which they were going to be placed so that it wasn't just saying, okay, you're another licensed teacher you can go work with other licensed teachers, but you had either a passion, an interest, um, or experience in an area that, that lended not only credibility, because we have great teachers across the district, but really could be a leverage point for other people. So I think that's that's been definitely a, a honed focus this year. Um, I think the professional learning opportunities, um, for, I know at the secondary as well, I can speak more expertly about elementary. Um, over the last two years, have really been tightly focused around uh, instructional practice. Not just great ideas, but really what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? So when we look at uh, the, uh, the instruction or the training teachers are getting in inquiry-based math instruction as a companion to our math expressions uh, resource, people are really learning how to teach differently. So when we first started our work in personalized learning, we just grouped kids because we just put them in a group so that they could be with a teacher. Now teachers are getting the training on how to work differently with kids. So it's, it's shifting the focus of some of that. Um, the balanced literacy work as well. So where teachers are getting really refined training and um, feedback from their administrators, from their coaches about what's going on in their classroom. How are they meeting all learners' needs through a balance of whole group, small group, and, and individual instruction? Right. I think some of the other areas, um, as we speak to instruction, I think the expansion of reading apprenticeship. We had teachers trained across all of our buildings. The focus on assessment practices um, is K-12. And, of course, we've been working with assessment, you know, forever. But it's really looking at refining those practices. How are we giving kids high-quality feedback? And how are we using formative assessment to improve instruction? Um, additionally, the K-12 vertical team, this will be the first time I think I've been told since maybe 2008 that we'll do that vertical team across all levels. Of course, we've done vertical teams, but in smaller spans. Um, so really digging into that to say, you know, what's working, what's not. And then the work around MTSS. Last year, we spent a lot of time um, doing some of the groundwork, and now it's really uh, starting to move that work forward. Um, of course, we've been working with having building and district goals, but I think tightening that alignment, aligning um, McCrell to those goals, aligning the coaches work, it's really a lot about deepening or taking the work that's happening to the next level. And just 
Yeah. As a follow oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come. Yeah, and it, it, it connects to Brian and what he talked about with the coaching. Well, one piece that we believe that our coaches have a huge influence uh, with our teachers. Of course, they're working with them on a daily basis, have a lot of access. So as we're continuing to support coaches in a strong foundation and providing them with, them with professional development as well around the high-quality instruction assessment, uh, feedback and reporting practices. So uh, we will start quarterly meetings with our coaches group. So we know that if we have a strong coaching group along with our, our strong leadership and instructional leadership from our building administrators, we can create really dynamic, strong teams in the building to provide high quality professional development in this area as well. So that's new work that will be happening um, that will continue to support uh, our coaches as well. And And, and these one of the things that I continue to be concerned with is, you know, and this is an ongoing issue, is just the amount of work that is being done. I mean, there's there's a lot. And, and I see a lot of strategies here. Um, so what are we doing to assess what's working and what's not? And I, I, I just hate the thought of spending time on things that aren't working. Um, so... You know what is going, and is that a question? Um, but yeah, I think it, can I you think come it, up with a good, an answer to that? No, it's a good question, was? Lisa. Um, <laughs> we were actually at one of the elementary schools today, uh, meeting, listening to their Focus Five, and one of the instructional coaches um, happened to be there. Actually, two of the instructional coaches were there as part of that meeting. And one of the instructional coaches said, you know, I was meeting with a teacher. I showed them this graphic about how this stuff aligns. And they said, wow, this is great. It finally feels like we're all pointing in the same direction. Hmm. Um, so I think you're right that we have a lot going on. Um, but I think people are starting to see the depth of the work and the alignment of the work. And so in asking our professional learning communities to have a, have a goal that has a student achievement result that they're measuring their success by, by having uh, focus five goals that are often contingent on success, by having, uh, or academic success, by having our Q comp goals, having uh, an MCA or an academic measure, um, all of these things are pointed in directions of having goals around student success, which is what we're all about. Um, if we're looking at uh, learning targets and saying, as talking as a team or as a school, saying how are our learners doing in regard to these learning targets and literacy, that we can have common conversation about that. So, even though it's a lot of work, I think a lot of it it's it, it's really braided work. So it, it's really fitting together nicely. Um, doesn't mean it's still not exhausting. It's no. just uh, it's just uh, more aligned than it has been. Yeah. You know, just to kind of piggyback too, I think last year as we were looking at action plans and looking at goals at this time last year, really identifying purposeful instruction assessment and feedback and purposeful instruction from our personalized learning SAR as, as a key focus area. And if you look at the strategies here, some of them are the same as last year and going deeper. There's a few that are new, but they all align with that work. And so as we think about strategies to, to Brian's point, trying to braid everything that we're doing together to support that instruction assessment and feedback and reporting because we know that's where that's what's going to move the needle for our students and their learning. Excellent. Thank you. Now, when you ask about, you know, how do we know if it's working, obviously informally, teachers in classrooms, uh, leadership teams at buildings are always looking at their practices and assessing did it yield the results we wanted? What do we need to tweak? But that is one of the key purposes for that K-12 vertical team to do the program review to say, what is working? How do we know? What maybe isn't yielding the results that we wanted? Are there things we need to stop doing or that we might need to shift how we're doing them? And that will be the work of that group throughout this year. Yeah, I mean, it makes me that constant assessment because the reality is the MCA is taken one time a year. Yeah. So if you were to do all this work and then, you know, that constant assessment and that constant kind of weeding of what is working and what's not working, and it's going to be different for every building, every teacher, I get that. But just want to kind of give permission for people to do what what they feel like is, is, is working. And, I mean, you know, we're 
you know, personalized learning. Um, so people need to do what, what works for them as well. Uh, teachers need to do what works for them as well. And then we need to continue to ask ourselves what's working and how do we know? Exactly. What's our evidence that's telling us this is a good thing for yeah. the learners in our schools? Thank you. Thank you. I could just add, if you'll allow me, board. To, uh, <laughs> something. Tim's not here. Tim's not here. Into well. this conversation, um, to to your point, Lisa, a little bit, and, and you heard it echoed in in the comments here. There, um, when you look at these strategies, there are some new and there's some next level, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be. You know, we did a disservice for a number of years when we created these plans and said. Okay, well, that didn't work, so let's try 10 new things this year. <laughs> and then next year we're going to try these five different things. And there's no secret sauce. There's no magic bullet. Because if there was, we would have found it years and years and years ago, right? So what do we know works? It's relationships with kids. It's high-quality instruction. It's that assessment, and it's that in intervention and enrichment. And all of this stuff that we're talking about it really continues to build on, on those pieces. And that's where we should be focusing our time. And we do need to continue asking if... If we're doing this, what aren't we doing? And that's a right. hard question to ask. Yes, that, and that's a good question too, is that we should continue. We shouldn't, we, we need to weed out things that aren't working. And you know, just like when you, when you get a new outfit, you, you gotta get rid of an old one. <laughs> Same way. I, I think what is that, helpful though and encouraging pull us back. is just the level of dialogue, right? So if we do look at the dialogue, and I, I think we talked about this, or I mentioned this at the work session as well, is that the data that you guys are, I think the level of discussion that you guys are looking at now into the root cause of some of this stuff, I think is a lot greater than it's ever been in the past, which I think is helpful because now you can start to ask those difficult questions. What's working? What's not? Um, I think for me personally as well, I think it is important to ask what's an achievable goal, right? I do have some concerns, like you mentioned, Ron, that just rolling over a goal, sometimes that isn't always your best practice. So um, what are you guys doing for buy-in at the school level, our principal level, or to look at these goals and make sure that they're included in those dialogues of, yes, this, we believe we can achieve this goal this year? Well, some of them are just learning of them for the first time, <laughs> <laughs> perfectly honest. Um, but it doesn't mean we haven't planned conversations along the way. So, um, in fact, we have an elementary uh, admin meeting tomorrow. Science is part of that conversation. I know we'll, we'll speak to the literacy issue as well. Um, when we, I do think uh, the, the work that we need to do around literacy by third grade and um, some of our, our science scores, when we look at the dip, we know that we're better than, than where, where that dip landed this year. So that does feel like we need to make a correction there. And the literacy, mm -hmm. it does feel doable. I, the graduation rate, that, that may be something that's beyond what we can manage within a year's time. Um, but I, I think we're re we really are looking at what are, who are we as a district and what are, what are our abilities to, to make change. And we, we're pretty confident that we have the right people uh, doing the right work uh, to make those changes. Because I do think it's important that you do get that conversation, that level of buy-in to understand that. Because you, know, you don't want to go multiple years, keep missing a goal, because it, right. it doesn't feel good, right? And then what is the benchmark? What are we really mm -hmm. measuring? And when I do look across the MCA, you know, the one thing is, is that this, you know, we always hear the test changes a little bit or this and that. And I think it's good to follow maybe the straight state trends a little bit as well, right? I mean, if you look at math, the state went down 3.5% over the four years. Uh, where science went down a percentage, half reading went up. Um, I think it's good to balance that in that at some level, too, of, of how is that changing and how are we changing as a district? I think that's really that. wise advice because, I mean, we're a really good state. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when we, when we compare the ACT scores and, and where we are um, as a district in regard to state, I mean, it's, it's, it, that feels really good. And so I think if we were comparing to the nation, we have really rigorous standards here. So I, I, I do think we're, we're doing good work, but we always feel like we can do better. Yeah. And we're a really good district. We're a great, in a district, great district. In a really good state, so hey. But I think to that point, you know, to bring it all back home, I mean, the board, we're about governance, resources, and other things. So I think what's helpful is when you hear these reports, and as that goes along, and to your point, Clint, you know, things that we can do and we can't do, right? As you better understand this, you know, that's what I think the board is here to help with, is what are the policies, resources, or other things, if help is needed in certain areas to build that up, because we are really driven by 
you know, the success of the learner and getting those right tools in place to make everybody successful. All right. Any additional questions? Thank you guys for the, for the report. And thank you all for being here. Yeah, and great work across the district. And I know most of you guys came to really hear about the long-term facility plan. <laughs> <laughs> Didi. I thought they were here for the levy certification. That's <laughs> way more interesting. Okay, so um, as, as we previously discussed, the long-term facility plan was reviewed at the September 10th work session. The plan included deferred maintenance, capacity needs, and program enhance, enhancement was divided into near, mid, and long-term priorities. If you recall, the, the dollar amount was pretty hefty at $280 million, which incorporated all of that. It incorporated our long-term facility plan um, that you proved in, in the summer. So um, a lot of items included in that. Um, going forward, what our recommendation is, and we kind of touched on it a little bit um, two weeks ago as well as we did a little earlier tonight, is to develop a task force to look at those items. And we need a, a task force to prioritize the list, uh, make recommendations, uh, hear about the plan in general, and then um, be able to come back to the school board with, with their recommendations. So um, what we would recommend is, is having a, a smaller task force, maybe about 17, 20 people, that would include um, school board member, um, administration, community members representing all four of our cities and our various schools at all levels, elementary, middle, and high school, students and, and parent, parents from our communities as well. Uh, the intent of that task force then would be to begin in October and uh, do their work for the next three months to review um, all the items in that, that list and, and come back to you with, with a proposal as well. Um, in front of you, I, I provided uh, an updated, uh, most recent proposed ch charge statement to kind of... Um, help you get kind of going forward with what is it that maybe we should we should look forward to from a, a task force perspective. So I won't go over the, the whole idea of that, and I know you've probably had a little time to, to look at that, but coming back, the goal then would be to come back, the task force coming back by January 14th at a work session with recommendations, um, the largest portion of the goal is of the task force, excuse me, is to provide recommendations that will preserve and maintain learning spaces for years to come and serve student population that's projected to grow to, um, by a thousand students in four years. Um, and I, I know that as a school board, your your main concern, as well as other than test scores and and, and enhancing learning. But it's also making sure that we have enough capacity in our schools to, to educate our students and have the appropriate safe um, and nourishing schools for them to attend. Uh, so recommendations are in there in, in that. And then, um, as you saw, there's some bullet points that talks about additional classroom space, uh, prioritization of those deferred maintenance programs, um, any enhancements to either programs or existing facilities, but along the way, also then considering tax implement, 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 implications. implications, thank you. Um, and that would include our bond debt and any, any future bond or operating costs as well. So with that, um, those are the, the items yeah, were listed. I'll just, yeah, I'll just jump in here a little bit too. Mm -hmm. So you know, based on the, the conversation we had um, at the last meeting, um, we wanted to put some some of these pieces in place for you and make sure you're comfortable. This is an important statement because this is really from you to the board to that task force that helps guide their work and guide their conversations. So it needs to be something that you're comfortable with. But again, based on the information we've presented and the conversations that I've heard and the questions you know we've heard from you um, and the comments, we're trying to capture that. And so really, you know, if anyone reads this, it should be clear what the board is asking the task force to do and what you feel is most important.
Any questions on the statement or one, thoughts on the statement? One quick question I had um, is the last bullet point, the consideration of the tax word that TD had a hard time with, implication. <laughs> um, Thanks for reminding yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, obviously part of the conversation that we've had over the last six months to a year has also been our operating costs and the potential for a referendum on that or a levy adjustment with that. Um, so as part of this conversation, then are we asking the task force to actually take a look at future operating costs and making their recommendation based on those assumptions? Or what will the role yeah. of the task force be so for that? I, I would say the, the role of the task force is really to look at that facility plan or the facility study, the enrollment growth, and recommendations around our facilities to do that. What they need to do in terms of that <clears throat> total tax implication is really um, understand, and we'll get some information back from Morris Leatherman that'll kind of be that guideline. Because what we don't want them to say is, yeah, it's all great, let's do it. Right. Here you go, board. And so th there has to be some look at what would that impact be if we did these projects. So they kind of have that limit. Um, you know, the operating piece will follow. So, you know, if they make a recommendation for um, a new elementary building, Right? We know there'll be some operating costs associated with that, so we'd have to look at that. But ultimately, what we'll do through the, the Morris Leatherman survey is bring information to you as the board to make that, what is the total ask if we do that to the community, including the operating component. So the, the final, like, what are all the pieces that we would go to the public and ask will all come through the board. Right? So essentially, our job as a board then will be to take the feedback from the task force, but then have an additional conversation on operating costs, Correct. and then we're going to have to potentially whittle down that recommendation based on the additional costs. Yep. Okay. And essentially their output is a prioritized list, which would facilitate yep. kind of going down that, yep. that level. And again, I think there'll be some conversations with the board once you get that full list and it's prioritized and have that conversation, there's different ways we could address some of those things. What goes into long-term facility maintenance? What goes into a larger ask to the community? So there's several ways to, to kind of move that around. That'll have to be conversations we have at the board table. Thank you. I think for me, I think this is a, this is a good charge statement. Um, I, as a person who sat on this, um, or a task force like this before I was on the board, I'd like to just make sure that if this isn't clear to the task force, that they can come back to us and ask questions. Sure. And if there is a need for further clarification, um, I don't think we need, I mean, I, obviously we don't want to abdicate our responsibility. Um, so if there are things that they need to know, then they need to feel free um, that they can do that and we can come back and, and do the work of clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yep. Why five years instead of ten? How did you scope the five years? Where are we at here? Fourth bullet point. <laughs> for, or, for so facilities. Or. So prioritize recommendations to oh. over the next five years. Well, you get beyond five years, as we've talked before, you may not know that what the enrollment growth is. So our near-term, remember we separated that into near, mid, and long-term. Yeah. So we really need them to focus first on the near-term, the five years. Um, and I th personally think that in five years we'd probably want to pull a group back together and look further at those lists because if our enrollment continues to grow, there could be the potential of either more add-on to buildings or we're adding on to a new or building a new school, whatever. So I think their main focus needs to be the first five. It doesn't mean that they can't do the whole 10. So if you looked at the output of this and mm -hmm. potentially a recommendation for us to go out and, and seek additional funds, would it just be for those five years then in your mind or would it be for a full 10? Hmm. I, think I think they're looking at the whole 10. Right. But yeah. also understanding the limitations of that, right? Um, and a lot can happen in the next five, six years, right? So we're a lot more solid on that growth. And, and when you look at some of those um, enrollment studies, they do this sharp jump and then they kind of flatten mm -hmm. off, right? So we're able to kind of look at what would be kind of peak 
estimates of enrollment at different levels, um, knowing that part of the, the, um, the benefit of having a, a Davis demographics is we can continue to come back and look at that every year in terms of do we need to make adjustments sure. to that. But I think the focus, you know, as Didi said, is is that five years because that's most likely um, to happen. No, it makes sense. Sorry, I, perfect sense. Because the near-term ones that we had categorized, recall, was a big dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sorry, okay. I, I was okay. confusing with bullet point number two, which is over the 10 years for the deferred maintenance. Right. Oh, and these okay. are the improvement over the five. So sorry, I just... That's okay. That's all right. I wonder if just to, to make it a little more clear, could we just switch around the 10 year and the five year one so that sure. they kind of, maybe it would make more sense just to yes, read it if you do like, of, let's look at the, like what's sure. the, what's the, what are their priority, like the main priorities? And then what are the things that if we, once we get those out of the way, like on a larger scope? Mm -hmm. It just helps keep that scope. Yeah. So just, you don't get, right. And if, then they just sort of like flow in order that you kind of like the order of priority on the list. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. Just a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joseph. One thing that um, might be helpful, I don't know if this is up for us discussion, but just consistency among the schools and the expenditure items. Um, I know one of the items, this is minor in cost, but for example, it was like the bathrooms and the hand washing stations. Mm -hmm. Some schools maybe had that, but other schools didn't even think about that. And if it is something that we need to do in one school, we might need to do it in all schools or just to assess that. So just the consistency in right item. so keep in mind we have some schools that are newer than yeah. others and some that are older than right. others and some have more complications when it comes to hand washing stations as far as just how their building is built so some of them have them already and some of them don't well, carver elementary for stuff. instance they do they, they do, do. Right. right. So then that wouldn't be that but then just to, some schools didn't even maybe think of that as an item and sure so we helped them along if they didn't think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but just that consistency, I think, just to, yep. you know, if that's a standard that our district is going to have, that we would have that, then the older schools maybe, if they're... Sure. I think, is, you know, I, I definitely agree with you. The problem is, and you saw that the last time with some of those dollar amounts, part of what the task force is going to have to wrestle with is... You know, as we look at that across all of our buildings, what's the long-term viability of that building? Right. So Correct. we may not be able to be. So I was, I think we were a little cautious in putting that in there because we may not be able to do that based on the cost, mm -hmm. you know, of some of those different facilities and just have to keep that. So I think we always have to look at that, that list and are, are buildings getting what they need relative to where we think we're going in, in the future with that. Mm -hmm. And that would be something to add to that. I mean, that could be part of that, whereas if we don't see that in the long term. Yeah. All right, so your plan is to form this. Um, so, Jeff, I think sorry, they said a question. Just a quick question. Um, October's like next week. Um, so do we have a list of names for this task force? We have the majority of the list, Lisa. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I hate to get tactical, yeah. and but I mean, Are you and, and and seventeen is still a pretty pretty big um, task force. But I, I understand we have to have representation from all of our schools. But yeah. um, Ron and I chuckled actually a little bit on that. <clears throat> a little Small smaller, yeah. seventeen. I'm like, wow. Well, I was thinking of the bigger task <laughs> well, right. force that we yes, had, we've had several years. Massive task force. Oh, I they were huge. They were huge. So okay, thank you. I can sleep tonight. Okay, I appreciate. That. Okay. All right, move on. No, my, my question was in the same line. So what's, okay. what's the timeline again? So form the task force in October. Um, is it, is Hopefully it tomorrow I have it finalized. Tomorrow and I contact them, tap them on the <laughs> shoulder and say, are you okay? And, and yeah, and, and, and to answer your question is to have some dates set up maybe like an every other week in the evening for those task members to, to meet. Um, at first it's probably going to be a bit, tad bit of information giving. Um, and then we'll get into some nitty gritty. And I, I don't have a formal plan for every single meeting yet. That's part of what I need to work on. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. Thank Any you. Any other questions, Mark? All right. Thank you, Dee Dee. Thank you. With that, that brings us into item 6.0 communications, information communications from the board. We will start over with Lisa. Well, golly, thanks. Um, so. 
Not my. I mean, I, the the big thing is MSB is starting their delegate, um, kind of looking at, <laughs> believe it or not, what the legislative agenda is going to be going forward. Um, there's a lot left on the table um, since the governor vetoed all the plans in education. So, um, kind of looking at what are some of those and in, in, um, focusing on what does MSBA feel like is the the priority. So. That's kind of what's happening. Any insight yet? And um, so they asked for kind of a list of if there was, a, I can't remember what the, the budget number was. I want to say $35 billion. And where would we spend um, the effort last year? As you know, we did a real focus around that cross-subsidy number. Um, and then everything moved to kind of to school safety. And so that actually ended up not happening. And the school safety grants are, um, are gone. I mean, I think. I think it was $25 million. Yeah. Um, and what was it, $350 million requests? Yeah. Requests. Yeah, um, on that day. And then there were several million that, that came in the next day. So, um, and then, of course, we're, you know, hoping for a, a 2% on the, on the formula. The interesting piece, though, is if we decrease the formula by 10%, if we decrease the cross-subsidy, then the question is, um, you know, how does that play out versus an increase in a 2% increase? So it, it, it will be interesting. But the things that are still on the list are um, there are certain legislators that just absolutely feel like we need to have a civics test. Because we don't test our kids enough here in the, in every district across the state, so they absolutely um, that that keeps coming up. Um, so, but who knows? Every legislative session is different, and the election will change things. So, so we'll see. And I know AMSD is having the governors um, come next time October. as well. So. The interesting thing about the governor's race is they actually have pretty similar takes on education. So, which they have very different takes on everything else. But on education, they have pretty similar takes. So that's kind of good news, I guess, for us. But but that's it. I think it's too early. I haven't had any site council meetings yet. So, Ron? So we're looking at that. Um couple things. Uh, first, I attended my first uh, rivalry football game, Chan Chaska. <laughs> my, my kids are getting finally of age where they are asking to go to football games, which is fun. So we got to enjoy a great football game that uh, we thought it was going one way until the last 30 seconds. So, But it was, uh, it was a great, fun, fun game to be at. A um, couple things. I passed out to each of you a, um, a new booklet that Southwest Metro put out. That they just, I think they did a really nice job. And in the in the front of the booklet, it actually talks about um, what are intermediate schools and gives a really nice overview of um, intermediate schools in general. But then it, um, throughout the whole booklet, it talks about the great programming that we um, that our district is a part of through um, um, through uh, Southwest Metro. So it's a great um, great read if you guys have a chance. And then with that, uh, the Southwest Metro Gala is on October 5th. It's a fundraiser for um, the foundation for Southwest Metro. And um, it's a, a great way they, they raise money that um, predominantly goes towards scholarships for students that, um, that oftentimes are our students. So if you guys are available on the 5th, um, you can uh, check with me and we can get you set up with tickets for that night. So, yeah. Are they doing the bus tour again? You know what? They actually canceled the bus tour this year. Oh, They've had okay. um, lots of great. It was scheduled for the twentieth. They just didn't get enough uh, okay. interest this year, so they canceled oh, that's it. Too bad. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. So they'll do it again next year. Oh, okay, very good. Um, I attended uh, Middle School East's site council on Friday, and one of the things they were talking about was their building goals for the year. And one of their um, focus fives. Um, relates to a survey question that students answered. They had gave a survey in the spring 
And this isn't the question verbatim, but it basically boiled down to, do you think your teachers have confidence in you to be able to be a successful student? And although their numbers weren't terrible, they weren't as high as they, I think, expected them to be. And I don't think, certainly think it's because the teachers don't care, because I think teachers are in this business because they do care about students and they want them to succeed. But I think somewhere along like, the line, we have a little disconnect between them communicating maybe that because I think there certainly is a tremendous value in saying you did a really good job in that assignment I know you I knew you could do it as a but for students who might be struggling at home or at school for to have someone say I know this assignment is coming up you might be worried about it but I know you can do it to give them you know to show them your confidence in them to help build up their confidence I just think it's it's tremendous that East is taking that on as one of their things to work on and they did give credit to Brett for um, writing that question so well done for putting that issue on the table <laughs> but I mean I know for like for my own kids they've had a lot of uh, Mr. Cornell comes to mind because they've had AP and X classes with Mr. Cornell in high school and he does tell them these are really difficult classes but you're gonna get it I want you to understand this I know you can do it and that's just a huge motivator and we talk so much about you know supporting staff to support students, but stu uh, staff just needs to make sure they're telling students, I know you could do this. And I think that goes a long way to helping them have a uh, successful year. All right, thanks. Joseph? I have no reports. Great. I have not attended a site council meeting yet this year as well, but I was at, um, Clover had their annual bingo night, bingo and pizza night. Um, and if you recall, we were at the work session there a yeah. couple of weeks ago, right? And they talked about the pride. It was great to see. I mean, the place was packed. You couldn't even get a seat to sit down. Uh, the PTO does, I think, just a phenomenal job just bringing together that whole community and all the kids. And uh, it was just, it was a fun night. It was good to see all the parents, staff out there uh, having a good time. So that leads it to you, Clint. All right. Well, I'll just quickly update. Um, um, as you know, last week I was at the... Um, Mid-America Association of School Superintendents Conference um, that was held in Chicago, and that's a group of about eight to nine states. Um, there were probably a total of about 50, 60 superintendents there, again, uh, from, from all these different Midwest states. Uh, but it's really a, a, a great opportunity to connect and, and see the, some of the same challenges and different challenges from some of the other states, but they rotate um, who's in charge of the conference each year. And so Minnesota was in charge, and, and uh, the two topics that we um, really dug into was around the Reimagine Minnesota and our work with equity, and also with personalized learning. And so um, we were able to present on those and, and facilitate some conversations. Um, and it was a great group from, from Minnesota and really some dynamic conversations and another chance for us to show off some of the work that we're doing here um, in uh, our district, but also across the state that I think is pretty impressive. But one thing I thought was a, a great statement, um, there was a, st a superintendent from Missouri, from Ferguson, Missouri, um, who moved there after they had all of the, the riots and a number of the issues. And um, he had been asked to go for the last several years and has, did not go. But when he saw the conversation we were going to have this year with equity um, and with personalized learning, he said, this is the year that I want to be there. So again, it, it turned out to be a great conference. Uh, my Minnesota colleagues, we, we represented the state very well, I think, um, and some really dynamic uh, conversations around, around that work. So Great. Thanks, Clint. With that, 7.0 is adjourned. Thank you.